sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. When we think of our life with the Messiah, what, what comes to mind? Well, we should recognize that he is, he is our life. Without him, you know, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We have the foretaste of, of the blessings. We have fellowship. We have just the joy, the, a heart that loves the scripture. All because of Messiah? What's that? All because of Messiah? All because of Messiah. Yeshua, Messiah, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, yo. do well 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 <laughs> welcome this is messiah uh, let's see here okay it's wednesday november 13th 2019 this is messiah matters number 279 ready for the san diego sun my name is a caleb Hay. also it's also wednesday november 13th for me my name is rob <laughs> I, i'm not gonna lie to you uh, everyone i i mean i am so caleb ill feels like I am so ill right C, now. Hashtag, hashtag P uh, or asterisk, asterisk. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure I got a fever. My whole body just aches. I, it's, you, the, it's, only, the only antidote is more cowbell. Here's the problem is that <laughs> when I go home, I'm like, oh, I'm going to go home early. I'm going to get in bed and I'm just going to sleep it off. Right. I go home and my wife's like, oh, I'm so glad you're home. Here, hold the baby. <laughs> oh um, oops man I, so my my oops, that's good my mouse went kapooey can, can, i i witnessed caleb have a little bit of it i saw him at the edge of his uh capacity to to uh be patient this morning and i heard his dad in the background saying be patient <laughs> okay it's like i know but my mouse is broken <laughs> Dude, it's just one of I'm those sorry days. You feel, I'm sorry, man. Well, it sounds like your whole body just hurts, man. Yeah. You're you're already pushed. Uh, you're already not in. You know. Okay. Um, well, let's talk about a couple of it, things. Man. We got a couple of things going on. First of all, here's the dilemma that I had to make about two years ago when I put up the show. After it airs. I put it up like I, I listed on YouTube. Now, normally what I do is I edit out the first three minutes with the countdown. And I know that everybody appreciates that. However, if you edit your video at all, it takes away the chat. So if I leave that three minutes in, then everyone who comes after and watches it will see the chat. Oh, so the question that I have for all of the listeners and for all the people in the chat room. Do they want to go down in internet history? Do you want to go down in internet history so that everybody can see your comments? Or do you, chat goes, yes, chat goes away. Yeah, I know it goes away. But the, the point is, is do we want to leave in the three minute countdown so everybody can see the chat? Ultimately, this is a really a decision for people. <laughs> Paul says, nah. Nah. They don't need I to like see the, the chat. Idea. Well, here's the question too: if we if we preserve the chat in the, it for perpetuity, would that affect if the people posting in the chat knew that? Would, would it that affect, affect what they say? Yeah, would they alter their comments? I don't know. Some some of our uh, some of the handles, you know, are like anonymous anyway. So it's like. Sometimes it's somebody's people would name, have to but... see how mean I am when I when I block people for you know three hundred seconds or when I ban people from the chat room. I, I yeah, know. yeah, I hear you, man. So here's the thing: is Rob and I will be out of town next week, and then the week after that, we will have just gotten back. Are we having a show that week? I call that DBT. Day before Thanksgiving. Yeah, uh, day before Thanksgiving. Yeah, it'll be pretty hectic. <clears throat> so here's what I was thinking. We could do some live streams from San Diego. Yeah. So I'd keep an eye on that. Second of With all, the palm tree in the background. Right. Second of all, I'm going to post both of the audios from 
Rob's lec uh, lectures at the SBL in the Messiah Matters More. So if you are a supporter, I know we've been slacking on putting up more stuff in the in the Messiah Matters More, but um, yeah, I'm going to put a both of his lectures. By the way, and I'm not going to tell you what it what it is. But next week and the week after that on Wednesday. Now, it's going to change, but we have a very special broadcast that's going to happen. I'll post them on the Wednesdays. They're under 10 minutes apiece. But uh, I think this is going to be a new, a new little segment that we will probably post a different day of the week every week. And I'm very excited for it. It's... Uh, it's been a long time in the making. And uh, yeah, so stay tuned next week, Wednesday. Keep your eye on the, on the page. We're going to have a very special little, uh, little broadcast, even though we'll be in San Diego. Okay. You know, I, before we came on this today, oh, I, man, I'm, I'm literally all over the place. My mouse is like way, sens like way more sensitive than the other mouse that I had, so I just touch it and it's like a cr Anyway. Okay, uh, producers. There we go. Here are our producers. Oh, I can't, can't. Why am I not seeing our producers? Is anyone? No one else is seeing our producers either. Okay. Hmm. Okay. I don't know why our producers are not coming up. Let's see if this works. That didn't work either. Huh. Okay. Odd. Well, I'm sorry. I don't have any graphics. I don't have anything. We're, I mean, today is just, it's one of those days. You can see our producers and who they are in the YouTube, uh, in the YouTube description. And yeah, okay. Um, so we've had some interesting, before we came on, I thought this will be a really short show. Every time I think that it's a longer show, so I don't want to jinx anything. Um, I'm, I'm kind of playing around with my screen too here. Uh, so let's go to my notes and uh, yeah. Okay, I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna blindside Mr. Van Hoff here. Um, basically this came in this morning. Jesus okay. says, I'm new to Torah. I have been in the faith for nine years and uh, I'm gonna try to uh, smooth this out a little bit. And I'm, I've been a new, and I'm a newbie to Torah. Physical circumcision has been a hard thing to understand. Should I be circumcised? So what I'm hearing is you have a a male grown, you know, an adult male. Right. Presumably physically uncircumcised. Right. He's been a believer for several years, but he's just now seeing the Torah as a gift from God for living life, right, in Messiah. Right. But it's not contrary to life in Messiah, right? And he's coming up against um, one of the commandments. Right. And he's wondering, hey, uh, maybe the tradition I came from reads the scripture in a way that says this is not only not for me, but would be actually a step in the wrong direction. Right. But that reading seems to be contrary or undermined by my new affirmation or a new um, desire to walk in the Torah. That's what I'm getting. Yeah. Well, I would say, is he part of a community? <laughs> you went exactly where I was going to go. What and is does your... he have resources to be circumcised? You know, I mean... What does he have any objection to being circumcised? You know, that's what I would ask him. But also, I would I would encourage community and brotherhood. Um, also, um, I gotta say, you know, we have to remember that the that circumcision is not part of the uh, Mosaic covenant. Circumcision is part of the Abrahamic covenant, right? Yeshua makes that exact point in John. I think it's John seven. He says, though, it, um, on the Shabbat you circumcise. Uh, a male, um, and that uh, in order that the law not of Moses not be broken, but he says, but it's not of Moses, but of the fathers. Or so, I, I, that's my paraphrase. But but in John's gospel, the point is specifically made that circumcision is of the Abrahamic covenant. So 
<clears throat> and that was another confusion. And we get that into Paul, too, when people I, talk about the Torah and the yeah, Torah. I, I think one of the big issues is that people are very confused about what Paul says about circumcision. And one of the things right. that one of the things that uh, Rob and I have argued, and my father as well, and others have argued, is that circumcision. When Paul talks about circumcision, there's not just one meaning for circumcision. That is physical, s- s- snip the tip. Rather, right. it can mean multiple things, and one of those things is a conversion process. And I think that this is so a, a great passage to highlight. This would be circumcision is nothing, uncircumcision is nothing. But what matters is keeping the commandments. Well, circumcision was a commandment. Right, exactly. So how can he say what matters is keeping the commandments? So I think that that physical circumcision as a sign of the Abrahamic covenant, I mean, we, as believers, I think that one of the great travesties that's happened to the church is to take the mark of the Messiah off of males. And my father's written a very in-depth paper on this. I wrote a paper on this in uh, a book that came out recently last year, or yeah, this year, called Celebrate the Feast at Torah Resource. And what the meaning and significance of circumcision is, basically what I did in in my article was I took my dad's very, very um, lengthy and scholarly article on the the meaning of circumcision, and I tried to break it down into a three-page, four-page article where where the, the average person would say, oh, okay, now I get it. Basically, what we both try to argue is that circumcision is a sign of the virgin birth. And so when you wear the mark of cir- circumcision in your flesh, you are literally wearing the mark of Yeshua as the divine Messiah that will come in the flesh. And so, I, I mean, I think that when, when the church misunderstood Paul to say that circumcision shouldn't be kept... I think it was really, really a blow to to the church, to, to men in the church, and to the church in general. When the head of the household wears, wears the mark of circumcision in his flesh, he wears the mark of the Messiah in his flesh, and the declaration that the Messiah would be divine, that he would come from a virgin, and that the father would be the father to the son. So... Somebody says, what is the extra rabbinical stuff? <clears throat> uh, that might be a comment to something else that was in the chat room. Um, but I think that circumcision was used as a shorthand to say that a conversion into a sect. Not a specific sect, any sect. Do you agree with that, Rob? Yeah, well, I mean, you, we have it. The whole issue in the first century is not only the difference in, in sectarian, uh, groups. Cause I mean, the Samaritans were circumcised, right? And the Jews, it, it, the fact that the Samaritans were circumcised did not legitimate them in the eyes of right. Jew, Jewish. Great uh, point. But here's another point is that even in one and Josephus and Philo both talk about other nations of the world that practice circumcision. And I think it's Philo that even gets into it, like starts talking about that it's health benefit and stuff like that. So the issue is ultimately one of what meaning is given it, not the very fact of the removal of the foreskin. And that's back to Caleb, your just point, uh, the point that you just made, which is spot on, is my view. Is it, and, um, you know, we just, in the our local community here, we are reading uh, the one year cycle, you know, in this last Torah portion was, uh, Lech Lecha, which Mm -hmm. finishes with Genesis 17, uh, and the giving of the new names, right? You have, uh, Avram is now Avraham, uh, Sarai is now Sarah and the child that who will be the first child basically conceived by a circumcised man, uh, because Abraham, because Isaac or sorry, Ishmael had already been born and was 13 but God gave the name of that child that hadn't even been conceived yet. His name will be called Yitzhak, and I will uphold my covenant with him and his seed after him. So this is all there at the end of Genesis 17, pointing towards to, and it says, is it too wonderful what God will do, right? When Sarah laughs and all this. The, the idea is that this miraculous birth, Paul gets into this a little in Romans 4, that it's like it, it's uh, he calls 
he, he can call something that's dead to life, right? Uh, something that is not, he can call it into being, that sort of thing. And that is ultimately a foreshadow, like you just pointed out, of Messiah. Now, this next week's Torah portion in the one-year cycle is Vayera, and this is with the Akidah, right? And you have uh, kind of the fulfilling, as James says, the fulfilling of, of, what, of the verse where it says, and it was Abraham believed God, it was reckoned of his righteousness, and we learn that that also is a foreshadow of the resurrection in the Epistle of Hebrews. He says that that somehow Paul knew, or sorry, somehow Abraham knew the surety of the promise through Isaac, who was a miracle child. Not only that, but it was through Isaac's seed after him. So offering him as a burnt offering, which was commanded him in chapter twenty-two, uh, somehow Abraham knew he. he he knew that God was sure that God was going to do what he was going to do. And it, it wasn't his problem. <laughs> his problem was just obedience. Right. And uh, anyway, we're, it, I, I look, look let's, let's go back to, I think it's Jesus and his, his comment. Ultimately, I think that any command that, that is given, if it can be kept today, it should be kept. That's what I believe. And I don't believe that Paul speaks against the physical act of circumcision. That's my personal interpretation of scripture. And, so I believe that it is a very good thing and something that, that males who are a part of the covenant and are in covenantal relationship with God should want to do, not just think, should I do it, but want to do. With that said, I also believe that this should be a conversation to be had within your local community. In other words, I think that the authority of a community is important. However, if your community is saying that they don't think you should get circumcised, there might be bigger problems. And if that's the case, then we have to ask, okay, what authority is more authoritative? That of the Bible and of God or of the elders within your community? This is a huge conversation that we could have, but ultimately I would say, I think obviously sola scriptura, the authority ultimately comes back to the Bible. And somebody says, didn't Paul circumcise Timothy? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, uh, and by doing so, he did not put him under a curse. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. You know, the scriptures, point. the scriptures are, uh, back to just one footnote on the Sola Scriptura. The scriptures are a beautiful heritage for us. Yeah. They are fully, the, the scriptures, as we study diligently, God will guide us through this, and, and we will learn time and time again that the scriptures help us interpret the scriptures, time and time again. We, you know, when we were down in, uh, or up, I suppose, up in Ontario, Canada. Oh, up and over. Up and over. Mr. Takis said a very poignant thing. He said, we hold in our, hand, in our mortal hands the very word of the living almighty God. Amen. Think about you know, that I just I have to say, I just emailed him this morning. Uh, hi, Frank and family. Here's why. Because every morning I pull out this delicious uh, bottle of of authentic Ontario <laughs> maple uh, syrup, countryside maple syrup. <laughs> yeah, we do too. <laughs> and put it on my cereal. And I, th and I it's wait, just you, such wait, a joy. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Well, back up. Wait, you do. You put it on what? You put what maple I... syrup on your on your cereal? Yeah, well, it's hot cereal. It's okay. Okay. So my, I have a, I have oatmeal. my norm. My routine is I have Fair enough. rolled oats, chia seed, and ground up flax seed. I th I was envisioning you with like and Cheerios. I put a little bit of that like... on there. It, oh, it's so good. No, no, no. No, I used to do that with honey. I would put a drizzle honey all over. You want to hear? Then they want... came out. Then, but that's when I was a kid. Then they came out with honey nut Cheerios. You want to but... hear how big of a moron I, I am? This is back. I was probably ten or eleven years old. Okay, and we had. <laughs> We, we had uh, some foreign exchange students from Japan, okay? It was just lovely ladies. And my, my parents, I don't remember where they went, but they went somewhere and it was morning time. And I thought, oh, this is my chance. I can put as much sugar on my cereal as I want. <laughs> oh, gross. So I go, and I, get the, I go and I get the sugar. And I have this spoon, and I'm like three huge spoonfuls and the and this girl's just looking at me across the table like 
What are and these she doesn't um, speak English. These right? Ameri- well, I mean, a little, but she's, I mean, you could see in her eyes, like, what is this American kid doing? I take a bite. I don't know what's going on. This thing tastes horrible. I didn't know the difference between sugar and salt. And I had put three huge spoonfuls of salt on my, on my cereal. <laughs> oh, man. That'll learn you. Yeah, exactly. That'll learn it. That'll learn. Oh, man. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so Rob and I did our own independent studying on this. I'm interested to see what you came up with. Um, actually, let's listen to the audio, right? We, we got audio. This was sent to us. Oh, man, what is going on with this mouse? Okay, here it is. Let's take a listen. Hey, Rob and Caleb. Um, Hello. I just I ran into recently a few uh, Hebrew roots and Messianic people on a Facebook I think that uh, the key word here is Hebrew roots because this is an interesting one. Keep, let's keep going. Um, and uh, they seem to have major objections to the word cross, as in like the cross of Christ. Hang on, just a sec before we go on, and I know I'm interrupting. I apologize. Did you come across the JWs? The JWs have a huge problem with the cross as well. Oh yeah, yeah. I used to have. I think I gave it away. I had one of these old New World Greek interlinear Bibles that a JW who visited me, gave me, and it had a picture. They, they had a whole article in the back of the book about, you know, and they had a picture of Jesus on the cross with his hand, like, above on a stake. Yeah, and they were real. Yeah. yeah that was they, they were real motivated by that. I think that this, I mean, ultimately, should I, should I just play my hand now? Should I show you my hand before well, no, let, all the are cards you, are dealt? Are we going to play any more of his? Of course that we it? are. Okay, let's keep going. I'll, I'll rewind. <laughs> messianic people on a facebook forum and uh, they seem to have major objections to the word cross as in like the cross of christ Uh, one person told me that the cross was a pagan roman symbol and that yeshua was actually crucified on a straight execution stake uh, so that i meaning that i shouldn't be using the term cross then Um, i don't personally have any issues on whether his sacrifice was made on a straight execution stake or on a cross with a cross beam Uh, but i don't understand the statement that the cross was a a symbol or as a symbol was a roman pagan idol which is what one person told me okay um before we go on here first of all i i i have to assume that these people who are saying that the cross is pagan and a pagan symbol and all this kind of stuff are also the people who post things that like the U S government has put an obelisk up. I mean, if you're going to say that the cross is pagan, then the straight stake is pagan too, because I mean the, the pole and or the obelisk is all over uh, paganism. So are you telling me that the, that the straight pole is less used within paganism than a, than a cross with a cross beam what an idiotic argument i mean no offense to well you can take offense if you want to but that is just an idiotic argument in my opinion it is my opinion that that is an idiotic argument because i mean at what point does some can you say oh something is pagan okay um the other thing that i noticed now if you're going to go on the, so one of the things i like to do every once in a while I don't know if people realize this. Outside my door, my father has a extensively large theological library. He's got about 6,500 books right outside my door in the Torah Resource Library, which is his own personal library. So basically, if I have a theological question, I can pretty much guess that there's probably at least a book, if not multiple books, or an entire section on what I'm looking at. So before I went out and uh, sc- scoured the books for something on the cross, which I found, by the way, uh, I decided I should do some internet hunting. Did you do the same thing, Rob? Did you go on and and and, and look no. for some? You didn't? Oh man! Did I dumpster dive? You mean? Uh, it, it was really fun. <laughs> I did not dumpster dive. Yeah, and and by the way, love is bigger is absolutely right. It's this is totally distracting. It, it, this I mean, these kind of things are just a distraction from the truth of the gospel. And ultimately what I think this is, especially from the Hebrew Rooters, the JWs, all these people, I think that it is a push against Christianity. In other words, oh, if the Christians like it, it's got to be pagan kind of a thing. This is a horrible reason to to think that something is pagan. Anyway, okay. What would you find, Rob? 
Well, I didn't find or... in, Oh, I, what I did, I'll just tell you what I did. I looked at some core uh, lexicons. So yes. I looked at the, the BD, uh, BDAG and Theological Dictionary of the New Testament and uh, some others. So the word is the Staros word. Um, S T A U R is the uh, O S. It's right. kind of how it would be spelled. And, and that's the to be crucified is from that same word. Um, and, you know, it, it looks like the broader use of the term could be either thing. It could be either a vertical column, like in structural, like a structural of a building or something, you know. Um, or it could be uh, in in the Roman execution style, uh, a, a vertical pole or a vertical pole with a cross uh, beam. So right. uh, there's no definitive, you know, information on the side of of archaeology or anything like that to to you know hammer down the the. Uh, the uh, one way or the other. So, um, but here, here's one thing. I did not find any evidence of a cross like used in Christianity, like the T as a Roman pagan thing. But I did find that two in two early church father, father works, uh, Justin Martyr, so second century and the epistle of Barnabas, both describe it as a T yeah, actually, so it's interesting that you went there team. because I I found so I've found um, okay. Let's let's explain this real quick before we which jump. means it's a old, which means it's early, 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 early. Well, hang on, just yeah. So one of the arguments is is that the cross was not used in Christian iconography until Constantine. This is totally false. What if people try to peddle this to you? The answer to that is no. You're wrong. That is absolutely not true. Go ahead, t- tell what you found in terms of church fathers because I found some too. Oh, well, I just found in the Epistle of Barnabas, um, it says, you know, he just says that the cross is like the letter T, like the letter Tau. Right. Which we all know is, is a T. And then um, in Justin Martyr, he uses the passage of the battle against Amalek in Exodus 17, where, which is this week's three-year cycle, um, interestingly enough, where where they're at battle and Moshe's holding up his, his arms. And he has Aharon and Hur holding up his arms. Right, yeah. And and um, Justin Martyr says this is a, this is the sign of, of Yeshua. And the fact that um, Joshua was present, Yehoshua was also this. Like he's saying, this is a a, a little hint forward of Yeshua's um, intercession for his now, people who, who, for their victory. Who wrote that? That's Justin Martyr. No, so no, no, the one before that. You said uh, the epistle. Oh, the epistle of Barnabas. Okay, yeah, so I which, got something which I think is probably early second century. Yeah, so I got. But, it, but I got, my point is that those are or these are both two, and, th- and there's no sense that these are dependent on other. They're completely different contexts, and there's no reason to think that they're both. Yeah, these are two independent witnesses, in my view. That early first century, you have the common knowledge that the the cross. Of right. Christ was shaped like a T, and you I'm know, I'm happy with that. That Keith, from a historian's perspective, I'm happy with that. I and there's and the fact that there's no evidence to the contrary. Yeah, Keith in the chat room says I have heard people say the cross reflects Tammuz, the altar of Tammuz. It is a distraction. I agree with you, and I saw this online too. One of the things that I saw was a lot of people reference. Take one guess, Alexander Hislop and uh, Tammuz. That's not to say that, that there oh. hasn't been uh, pagan iconography found with a with different T's on it. We'll talk about that in just a second. I want to talk also to what you said. Uh, Clement of Alexandria, who lived somewhere around 150 to 215, says, as then is astronomy, we have Abraham as, in, as an instance. So also in arithmetic, we have the same Abraham. For hearing that Lot was taken captive and having numbered his own servants born in his house, 318, he defeats a, a great number of, of the enemy. They say then that the character representing 300 is as to shape the type of the Lord's sign that is the cross. Right. Tertulli- and that's, what, that's basically what Barnabas says the same thing about Tert- the tree. Tertullian also in De Corona also says something about the sign of the cross, that people were putting the sign of the cross on their forehead. Marcus Minus- Minucius Felix, he died circa 250. 
uh, in Octavius, uh, his uh, d- disagreements with Octavius, chapter nine, he argues that uh, he argues that the Christians don't worship the sign of the cross. Why would he? Obviously, um, and then again in number twenty nine, he he lays out uh, in chapter twenty nine, he lays out an entire um, argument about the cross. Um, so the idea that Constantine made this a part of Christian iconography and therefore it's it's pagan is such nonsense. It's it's so not true. Now, when we talk about um, pagan iconography, one of the things that I realized about pagan iconography of the cross is, is that there's no standardization. In other words, people say, oh, the cross was used. But if you look at the different crosses that they say are being used, first of all, the Egyptian cross has a huge oval at the top. It's not just a cross beam cross. Oh, that's the Ankh. Right. So yeah, and that's not what that is. That's a. That's already been demonstrated. What that is. That's a. Um, a spinal. Uh, that's a vertebra of it. That's the 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 Egyptian Ankh, is a is a top topical, you know, shot of a vertebra, from an animal because that's the spinal fluid goes through the thing and the sh- it's not actually a. <laughs> it's had nothing to do with with. Well, there's others like that too. You know, other other uh, symbols that were used that people are saying are the cross, are what has been come come to been known as a swastika. This uh, is okay. This back to the. I appreciate the voicemail we got. This reminds me of Hebrew. Like when I hear this kind of stuff, I think, oh, that's Hebrew. Hebrew roots, roots. right? Exactly. And so I I know that we had this whole thing a couple weeks ago about Hebrew roots and all this, but the fact of the matter is. I would probably say if we just if you start sharing these kinds of things with me, I would go like <laughs> we need a game show. <laughs> we need a game show. It's like Hebrew Roots or Messianic. Right? Is it Hebrew Roots <laughs> today on Is It Hebrew Roots? We're, do- we're doing that. <laughs> we're doing that. <laughs> and- Christian, Jewish, or Hebrew Roots? That yes. I, oh, that would yes, yeah, exactly. I'm sorry, Rob. Here, that's not why, correct. Okay, I, that I, it sounds silly, and I I understand the people who. <laughs> who have used the word Hebrew because they think of, uh, it represents their redemption, their crossover from darkness to light, like Abraham. And I, I respect that. And I, I respect that use. But in my experience, again, I only know my own experience. This is the kind of stuff that I would, I'd hold up, you know. Hebrew roots, right. I would say Hebrew roots. You know, I'd hold up the Hebrew roots sign. And and it sounds like, well, to to be fair, the caller says, Hebrew roots and messianic people on a Facebook forum. So he probably doesn't know what label to use. So he's just messianic using messianic too, but yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Yeah. Um, here's, here's the thing. Okay. And I did see some crossbeam tees, just like what is used today around Christians necks, uh, on some ancient, uh, iconography of, of pagan paganism. But what is the, what is this for? In other words, what was the, is it the sign of the actual God? I don't believe so. I think that this was to show something perhaps and this is I mean this I'm taking this out of my own mind. This isn't I didn't read this anywhere. You know, that the, the that the particular God had uh had the power of life and death or um something like this. But ultimately, what was said in the chat room is a really good one. The fact that it could have been a pagan um a pagan Roman symbol is even more a good thing because Christ comes, dies on the cross. My phone is talking to me now. What is going on? Um, it could have been something. It, basically, if, if Christ comes and dies on this thing, then guess what? He's overcome it. He's overcome death. The fact of the matter is, is that the w- reason that Christians started using the sign of the cross was because Yeshua died on it. He overcame death for his, for his elect. It's a wonderful thing. He's put down all the all the evil and all the sin and all the principalities by dying on the cross. He's taken death, which is the the it, which is the judgment for sin, and he's paid that price for us. That is a beautiful and wonderful thing. And I it's I mean it's just so ridiculous. By the way, okay, so this one, let's go here real quick. This was interesting as well. Methods of crucifixion. By the way, what is this? The Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible, supplementary volume. 
I'm on page 199 for anyone who really cares. Method of crucifixion is what this is under. The evidence of sub, uh, is subject to three interpretations, any one of which alters the traditional view of Jesus' crucifixion. And um, maybe we should say logical evidence from uh, recent archaeological evidence from Israel has thrown dramatic new light on methods of crucifixion in antiquity. The first skeletal remains of a crucifixion were unearthed from a first century AD tomb found at Givat HaMivtar in Jerusalem. The tomb lies about one and a half miles north of the second wall of Roman Jerusalem. And I can show you pictures. Basically, they found uh, a nail still in this dude's right arm. Or and, a bone, yeah, or ankle or whatever. And what, yeah. this, what this shows is that he certainly was uh, nailed to a cross with a cross beam. And they, they say that. The difference, they say, and I do have pictures here. I wonder if, the, I wonder if my camera will pick these up. Um, you can see how the legs are different. So either they're bowed out or they're bowed to the side. That's the difference that they mark on how they believe that the, the, uh, the crucifixion happened. Really very interesting. Uh, also gruesome. But anyway, the point is, is that um, they argue in this book that certainly this man in the first century was crucified on a T, on a cross with a with a cross beam. So, I mean, it's like the Star of David. You know, people are, oh, the Star of David's pagan. But come on. I mean, I just don't, I don't buy it. I just do not buy it. Um, do I think the Star of Dave, David is worshipped? Well, I mean, somebody might worship it. But I don't think so. Look, what's interesting is that people who, who take these symbols and they say, oh, these things are pagan. Oh, you know, people worship these symbols. You know, God told Moses to put a snake on a, on a rod. And when people looked at it, they'd be healed. Now, ultimately, God tells them to do that. So it couldn't have been wrong. What ends up happening? Israel misuses it and starts worshiping it. <laughs> so the thing itself is not necessarily bad. Anytime you worship anything that is not the almighty God, it becomes idolatry and is wrong. So um, could the cross be, I mean, obviously I've, I've watched, I watched a documentary recently on, uh, I believe they were Catholics, but it, it was this mass, right? And they're looking at the different, the different, uh, you know, there's a crucifixion here and there's a picture of Mary here and they're the different stations. of Yeah. The and they're doing their, you know, they're doing their whatever, sprinkling their incense towards it or whatever. And, you know, praying and all these kind of things. I think that at that point, you're obviously uh, that the any kind of imagery and sim symbology has been taken to a completely different level. This whole thing was fought within Christian history. The iconoclast uh, uh, debate was one that I think. Uh, I mean, I can't even believe that Christians had that debate. I think the imagery can be used wrong, of course, but I think that a Christian who wears a cross around their neck, or if a Christian wants to wear a Star of David around their neck, or I've seen Star of David's uh, with a cross inside of it, I don't have any problem with that. Now, if you take it off, put it on, you know, the wall and then bow down to it and pray to it, we got a serious problem. On this note, there's the one, <clears throat> they call it the messianic seal. Yeah. Where it's it's got a menorah, and then it turns into a star of David, and then it turns into a fish. Yeah, we talked about that, remember? Yeah. Yeah, That I remember I there was a book tour, probably, it was 20 years ago. Right. Like, I had a book he was selling, I don't remember his name, but he claimed to have seen these vessels, and they said it was from James, all the way back to James. Right. And... Turns out to be total nonsense. There's no, yeah, yeah. Well, because all the evidence disappears and they think it's because Jews are trying to hide it, you know, but it, it makes a good story. But again, I, you know, there's people who have used that. They think that is a, a symbol that goes all the way back to the first disciples of Yeshua. And it's not. Yeah, it's not. I, actually, I think the earliest uh, Christian icon iconography, sorry, that we have uh, that's well known is the fish. And this is the chat room is saying, don't forget about the fish. The fish is actually, the ichthus is actually the uh, 
is actually one of the earliest, I think, signs that we know was used by Christians. And it had fins and scales. <laughs> yeah, of course. Well, here's another, here's another interesting thing, a side note about early Christian iconography. <clears throat> Every time a meal is portrayed, it's a kosher meal. There's no Christian iconography where there is unclean food on the table. <laughs> interesting. Bread, you've got bread, you've got wine, and fish. That's pretty much it. And the fish are freshwater, you know. I want to make tilap tilapia or whatever. Right. Okay. Um, I want to switch uh, conversations here. Maybe we will get done a little bit early today. That'd be fine with me. Um, Caleb's hurting. Uh, yeah. Pray for Caleb. <laughs> uh, Pray for our safe safe travels and God's mercies on us. And also yeah, no doubt. speaking about next week. And pray for your friend Rob here, who's got, I've got, so yeah, I've got two presentations. They're on the same day. So I've got one Sunday morning and one Sunday afternoon. <clears throat> and thankfully, there's plenty of breathing room between them. So I'm not going to be like scrambling. Keith, but, uh, Keith, but in the Keith in the chat room asks a question. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I agree with you. Please be praying for us. And yes, absolutely. Rob needs a lot of prayer. Every time the uh, every time he is about to present, he's always uh, he's always a little uh, verklempt. <laughs> I can you I get stressed. I get stressed. Not not always, but I I think I think Caleb, you would probably admit that over the years, I'm I'm becoming tempered and more level headed. Sure. Generally, it, there might it might, but you're still a little you know, verklempt every once in a while, though. That's there's nothing <laughs> wrong with that. Um, so Keith brings up a good point. So Rob and Caleb, let's expand this to the celebration of Christmas. If no worship is done on that day, is it okay to celebrate Christmas? Now, uh, this goes back to my comments about Halloween. I got in a conversation on Twitter with somebody about Halloween and whether or not it was wrong for a Christian to go trick-or-treating. Now, I think that absolutely it is, and I think that it's part of the celebration of a false god and a false deity. Okay, so I think that basically what's the whole point of trick-or-treating? The evil spirits would come and you'd try to give them a present so they wouldn't do, do evil things to your house. So now the kids dress up like the evil spirits and come and, and get the candy. Is it, it's like to appease, the, appease the, the threat? Yeah. The threat of the, of the demon? Yeah, so I mean, yeah. the, the question that... Now, I'm, I, I think anyone who's listened to a lot of our shows knows that I'm not on the whole bandwagon of everything within Christmas comes from, uh, you know, pagan worship. I think a lot of different factor factors have seeped into Christmas. Ultimately, I believe, and Rob disagrees on me with me on this, I believe that that uh, a lot of, of the uh, Christmas worship comes from Saturnalia and or from sun worship. And, uh, and therefore, I think that the origins of Christmas in and of itself say that we should not be a part of that celebration. I think that participating in it is to participate in something that is not of God. And we are told specifically in Torah that we are not supposed to worship in the ways that the, that the pagans worship. Now, with that said, is there anything wrong with going to your congregation or worshiping on, on uh, December 25th? Of course not. What if it falls on a, on a Shabbat or what, you know, whatever? Of course you're going, of course there's nothing wrong with that. Is there anything wrong with, you know, I one of my favorite things to do is go with my family and, and uh, go look at Christmas lights. We drive around and look at all the Christmas holiday, I'm sorry, all the holiday lights around our neighborhoods. Another thing that my wife and I uh, admittedly have the greatest guilty pleasure of all is Christmas music. We love, my family loves Christmas music uh, from about October 1st until about January 31st. Um, our, our, our car and our home, uh, is, is usually playing some form of some station on, on Pandora of, and the of best Christmas of those songs music. were written by Jews. Oh, of course. <laughs> like Irving Berlin. Yeah. I'm dreaming. Yeah, exactly. That's, and, uh, know, Bing Crosby, the, but yeah, that's, a, it's a, there's a lot of songs that are not <laughs> Christmas music that people think are Christmas. Jingle Bells was written for Thanksgiving. I don't know if people know that. Um, anyway, the point is, is that, uh, just because it has a Christmas label on it doesn't necessarily mean that it's pagan. But the point is, is I'm not, yeah, you know, 
I, and I tell you a story, and I think I told this story when it happened. A couple of years ago, my family and I uh, flew down to California. My, my uncle is a pastor of a very large, I think, they, I think I don't know, four to 6,000 person church down in uh, California. And uh, it's a beautiful church. And, and uh, he said to me, hey, your family should come. We were down there, I think, on like December 7th or something like that. And he said, look, we're, we do an Advent concert. You'll really enjoy it. There's amazing musicians. You know, we have a full orchestra, we have a full wow. choir, we have a full kids choir, and it's pro. It's real pro. Come and check it out. And he said, and most of the music's just about, you know, praising the Lord. I said, great, let's do it. So we go, you know, he's he's got front row seats for us. It's it, it, spared at no expense, right? We get there, there's a huge Christmas tree right on the stage, you know, okay, whatever. And there's wreaths all around and whatnot. And they get into this thing, and and sure enough, the orchestra is amazing, the uh, the the choir is amazing, kids choir is amazing, amazing. But it's it's very Christmas esque, you know. And they're singing about Christmas, and my son, who I think was four at the time, turns to me and goes, "Dad, if we don't celebrate Christmas, what are we doing here?" <laughs> but what I love, okay, what I love about that is it it's not <laughs> your, your son's not triggered. You know, no. it's so funny that we're in this culture of like triggered people get triggered like if you're triggered by a cross right right well that's that's one thing we've talked about that day but if you're triggered because a church has a christmas tree up then that's that's your problem right because their view of you have to at least have the be give a generous interpretation they don't see it as a pagan symbol they right. see it as reflecting a, a a tradition even if it, the tradition's only a couple hundred years old of celebrating when they believe the Messiah was born. Right. And you know that when on those Christmas services, they're going to read Luke chapter two. They're going to read Matthew one. You know what I mean? They're going to read, they're going to conflate the stories or Matthew two, you know, of the, of the wise men with the manger and all this kind of stuff. And yeah, you might go, well, there's a lot of stuff that they don't understand. And if they understood, maybe they would change their position. But, you got to learn to live with that, that gap and not behave in like a, tr oh, you know, get all upset and, and triggered about it because Look, you that's... know what my, my, my wife and I, when my wife and I got married, her family was real big on Christmas. This is not, I mean, this is not, this is no small thing. Now her, her parents aren't religious, at least not in the, you know, they don't go to church. Let's put it that way. Okay. And Christmas for them was more about family. They wanted to get together. They wanted to eat. They realized that we didn't celebrate Christmas, but, you know, come on over, have dinner. Can you have dinner with us? We said, sure. And we did. We'd go over. They'd have dinner. <clears throat> We'd all have dinner. There was always some presents that were given, you know. Um, I don't even think that they had a tree when, you know, the, the first couple of times we went. But then we had Ben. The first year Ben was too young to understand, but all of a sudden there was a tree there. And the next year, he's starting to be old enough to understand. Now he's one in a couple months. And, you know, now all of a sudden we're going to start instilling tradition. But there's not only a tree there, but there's also stockings. And, oh, well, we know you didn't celebrate, but here are some Hanukkah gifts that are under the tree. And, oh, we didn't want you to feel left out, so here's a stocking for you. You know, by the time Ben's two, we're saying this is not... We can't, I don't know if we should be doing this. Obviously he's going to, you know, by the time he was three, we said, we can't do this. This was a huge rift. And still to this day remains a huge rift between me and my in-laws and my wife. Now my wife, my wife now is the one who is even, in other words, like if, you, if you're if you going to tell me I have to do something, she'll push even harder. So when her parents are like, oh, come on, you know, the more they try to get her to do it, the more she's like, absolutely not. Okay. For the last 10 minutes of this, what I want to do, we've been, we, the past two shows, we talked about women as elders, and we got a great, Trish wrote in and said, can you clarify the specific roles of an elder, preacher, and teacher? What specifically would be a prophet, prophetess fall under, if any, if we understand these roles clearly, and if a congregation separates these roles out, maybe that will help clarify the roles. Okay, now, my congr the congregation that I attend, AIM, uh, we're actually going to go through my father's chapter on this. My father has a great chapter on this in his book, I Will Build My Ecclesia, um, 
published Torah Resource. Of course, you can find this on Torah Resource. He starts on page, oh, I don't know. He starts on page 123, uh, chapter 8, Establishing Torah Communities in Outline. And he goes through the different roles. I will say this. I'm not convinced that there are still prophets the way that we think it, like biblical, the way we think of prophets today. I think that the word of God, we hold it in our hands. And so there's very, now there might be things that the Lord, you know, safety issues, you know, especially when we hear stories of, you know, uh, World War II and people being chased or whatever, you know, don't go, the Lord will tell someone, stay away from this house or don't go in here, this person's a traitor. Okay, so that might fall under, I'm not saying that there couldn't be such thing as a prophet. In other words, God speaking to a person. And, but ultimately, in, in the Torah, when we have prophets, they're going to the nation and they're speaking as, you know, the word of God is coming to that person to give to the people. And I think that this might be what's going on even in the apostolic era. Once the canon is closed, though, God's given us his word. He's told us what he needs to tell us. So... Everything else basically comes down to interpreting the scriptures, which falls under elder, right? Anyway, um, so my father brings up two offices that are clarified within the scriptures. That is elders and deacons. Women are deacons in the scriptures. And, uh, well, let's just read some of this, hey? Do you want to jump in here? I don't have my copy with me, so go ahead. Okay. He says on page 127, the apostolic scriptures, that's the New Testament, give only two offices of, of authoritative leadership within the congregation of Messiah. I would agree with him, and not only that, but the idea of apostle, if we take that word away and just say sent one, so you might send a missionary out, the mission, missionary might go out to a different place to help establish a community or to help build up a community or something like this. That missionary does not overrule the elders, in my opinion, that are in that that if they're in a community that they're going to. And as they help build up leaders to, to be elders in a community, they are trying to train those elders to, to, uh, to govern the community. The, the sent one is not necessarily in an authoritative position to do so. Does that make sense? Okay. So he says, overseers, note the use of the feminine noun. Um, he says, the primary duty of the overseer is twofold. To feed the congregation from the word of God, from the word of God, guarding the apostolic message, to make sure it is properly taught and lived out within the community. I would say this about Torah too: that the Torah is properly uh, lived out within the community. Um, and the apostolic halakha limits the office of overseer to men. There are no examples of female overseers in the apostolic scriptures, nor in the synagogues of the first century CE. And see the term elder, Hebrew zaker. Old man, head of household, community Zakane. leader. Zakane, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you're right. Originally the natural leader of the family, clan, father, grandfather, etc. Thus, the primary meaning is leader, one having the authority within a family unit. Elder came to be used generally for anyone who fulfilled a leadership role within the community. Note that the qualifications for an elder are never given in the apostolic scriptures. We should presume that the term was used generally for, for recognized leaders within the community, like Acts 14.23. So in other words, the, the, the elder is, uh, is set to interpret the scriptures and help people walk out their faith. People and families walk out their faith within the community structure. And they have authority to do so. So in other words, they are making decisions on scripture and helping people with spiritual matters. The other office is deacon. The primary meaning is servant or helper. The primary role of the deacons is in matters of administration as it pertains to the general function of the community. The office of deacon carried with it the necessary authority to fulfill the, uh, the duties of the office. The office of deacon was held both by men and women. And I think that it's a very good practice to have husband and wives be deacons because I see deacons as trying to help the community with within personal matters. So in other words, that are not theological. So in other words, if a, if a widow can't pay her rent, the deacons would go and assess whether or not it's because whatever it might be, and then decide whether or not money should be given from the community to the, to the widow. The same would go for a family. Maybe a father lost his job or something, 
or maybe there's a death in the family, the deacons would go and be the first on scene respondents to comfort and to be there. This is why I think husband and wife are really good because if you have, and that's not across the board necessarily, but because if you have a woman that is in, you know, that is in a place of crisis, it's not necessarily right for a man to go and try to comfort that woman. You would want a woman to go, right? So this is why a husband and wife would be a great team to do such a thing. Um, he says, it may have been that deacons were sometimes a husband and wife team, uh, such as 1 Timothy 3.8. And following, were the, were the men appointed in Acts 6 deacons? Perhaps they were the forerunners of the office as it was eventually established in the apostolic community of the way. He goes on. I mean, this, is, this chapter is quite a large chapter. And uh, I know people who have modeled their communities after this chapter. And, I, and ultimately, this is all resting on Scripture. So I hope that that's, uh, people are still talking about Christmas in the, in the chat room. Um, well, that's helpful. I think that I would rec- I recommend that book for people um, for a multitude of reasons. But yeah, that, that's very helpful. I logged in to, can we shift to the chat room a little bit? Of course we can. There was someone who says, uh, Matt uh, says, Rob, Caleb, I think you guys are saved, but are wasting your time in the Torah movement is dead as a doornail filled with wicked people. Oh, who is this? Um, right? What who this is, is Matt Powell official. Yeah, this. I Matt, would say this, Matt. Matt who on. are you to tell us we're wasting our time? <laughs> right. Who are you to tell us how we are laboring for Yeshua? Shame on you, telling us you think we're saved. Wow. Thank you for your opinion, <laughs> but go out and work in the field that Yeshua called you to. Don't come in here and fish for followers or whatever you're trying to do. But go work where Yeshua is calling you. And I guarantee he's not telling you to come into our chat room and tell us that we're wasting our time. So get out or shut up and participate in what we're talking about. Yeah, Matt is a uh, is known for coming into our chat room and only talking about how the Hebrew Roots movement is pagan. Which... And you don't want to know what? You think, you think wicked people are only there? You don't think there's any wicked people in the church? Go watch some Paul Paul uh, Washer videos. Yeah, my friend. There's wickedness everywhere in this world, and if you're not going to stand in the full armor of God with the sword of the Spirit, and handle it like a man, where He plants you, then shame on you for coming in here and telling us that we're wasting our time, because if Yeshua has called us to do what we're doing, and you're telling us we're wasting our time. Then you're of the devil, my friend. And the Hoff goes off. <laughs>